Friends, please join with me in the spirit of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Help us lay down those burdens that we carry in, those places and spaces of things that are unresolved, those moments that we need an inbreaking from you to help draw the circle wider, to embrace not only others, but also all that is within each and every one of us. Open now our sacred imaginations that these words of scripture might infuse and inspire our living this day and every single day this week. In the name of the one who is the light of the world, Jesus the Christ, amen. Amen. It was a beautiful, beautiful spring day in Iowa. The, The birds outside were singing, serenading us, beckoning us to come outside. The the lilac bushes were in full bloom, brimming with life, the fragrance in the air. And butterflies were frolicking, showing you all the fun you could have out there. But I, I was stuck inside, inside my fourth grade classroom, where it wasn't the smell of lilacs, just the smell of disinfectant that hung and hovered in the air. And it wasn't frolicking or fun we were having. It was my teacher trying to convince us how important long division was. Oh, life can be so cruel sometimes. I sat there, staring out the window, when all of a sudden, the intercom system in the classroom crackled and came to life. And this disembodied voice, much like what Peter might have heard, this disembodied voice came and said, Please send Wes Bixby to the principal's office. Oh, that brought me back to reality quick. (laughs) I got up. I left the classroom. I, I can vividly remember my shoes squeaking against the shiny linoleum floor. And with every step, my amygdala, my lizard brain up here, started coming up with all kinds of fictional problems for why I might be in trouble. I mean, maybe, maybe there was a camera in the classroom that saw me looking out the window and I was in trouble for daydreaming. Or maybe, maybe I had failed the Iowa tests of basic skills. (laughs) Or maybe the fashion police were there and were going to accuse me of wearing Velcro shoes. Remember those from the 80s? By the time I got to the principal's office, my heart was racing. My my hands had perspired so much, I I couldn't get a grip on the doorknob. (laughs) Eventually, I, I got the door open. I stepped inside, and there was a whole crowd of other fourth graders. And the principal was standing there, a smile on his face ear to ear, And he told all of us that we had been nominated to be part of the safety patrol. (laughs) Choir, finally, finally somebody recognized and rewarded my rule-following ways. (laughs) You know, maybe... Maybe it was the lure of the orange belt we got to wear or, or the plastic badge we got to wear too, but I, I leapt at that opportunity. I, I remember we had to take a class, a class that told us, you know, how we could stop traffic with our hand. We didn't have those fancy stop signs like Safety Patrol now, or, or how you motion the younger children across the street. Every morning, a crew of us were out there doing what we were told to do, There was a carousel of first-year teachers who had to watch over us as well. Sometimes in the bleak midwinter, we would get a a cup of hot 
cocoa to warm us up. At the end of the year, at the end of my fifth grade year, we were given a computer generated, remember this was the 80s, this is fancy, a computer generated certificate declaring us all good citizens and we got to keep the badge. <laughs> you know, I actually went and found it. <laughs> this badge, it, it reminds me a little bit about Peter in our scripture reading today. It, it also connects to our lesson last week of Saul, who becomes Paul, deputized himself. Both Saul and Peter are trying to follow the rules and the regulations. They're trying to conserve and preserve parts of the faith that they believe are so vital. For Saul last week, it was about people who had stepped out of bounds in terms of their own faithfulness. But for Peter today, it's maintaining his, his Jewish identity through the dietary laws and restrictions. You see, Peter still upholds those even as he's following Christ. He's this, he's this complex mixture of, of both new understandings while also maintaining some of what he was raised with. Hold that image with me. So here's Peter, we're told, goes up on the roof about noon while he's waiting for lunch to be ready. And his stomach is rumbling and grumbling, but he, but he starts to pray. He starts to pray, and as he does that, he witnesses this blanket buffet of all kinds of off-limit animals. We're, we're talking shellfish. We're talking bacon. We're talking squirrels. Anything with four feet hooves, and chew their cud. There's this blanket buffet coming down while his stomach is rumbling and grumbling. But Peter, wearing his badge of faith, sees this as a test. And he, he's going to pass with flying colors. I want you to notice three times, three times that disembodied voice of God gives him a permission slip to eat, gives him a permission slip to draw the circle wider than he had before. And three times, Peter refuses. He clings to his badge, to the rules and regulations that he has been brought up with. It, it sort of reminds me of Ken Wilber's work. He, he talks about stages in our faith. I, I think there's stages that we come back to time and time again. And the one I'm thinking about is the cleanup stage. When, when we want to present ourselves as being good people, our halos shining over our heads, that, that we know the rules, that we're following them, we're, we're coloring inside the lines of faith as has been given to us. As I said, you don't ever leave that behind. You can come back to the cleanup stage in faith, in life, when you, when you go and meet a new person, when you start a new volunteer opportunity, you want to prove to the others that you've learned the rules and regulations. When I came 10 years ago, I spent the first year trying to understand some of the rules and understanding. Here's a fun homework assignment that probably no one's going to do, but <laughs> what are the rules and regulations around our church? They exist. What are the rules? And, and some of them are written. Those are, those are things like our core values or our covenants. But what are the unwritten rules that we all try to stay in line with. You know those rules that when you say something, the other person frowns or, or, or shakes his or her head back at you. Those unwritten rules that, that we sometimes wear like badges of faith in the passage today. 
I, um, I take some solace in the fact that Peter, who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who knew the smell of Jesus' breath and, and could hear his voice, it was woven into the neurons of his brain. That three times Peter can hear that voice and still think that he has to maintain the rules and regulations. That Peter, Peter needed a remedial lesson in God who keeps drawing the circle wider to include others. So here's the uncomfortable part of this passage, the first one which is, did you notice that Cornelius gets it on the first ask? Cornelius, who is the outsider, gets it before Peter, who has to be told three times, and even then is still puzzling it all through. What does that mean, that, that sometimes it's those outside who get it sooner than those on the inside? Uncomfortable truth number one from this passage. Uncomfortable truth number two is that Cornelius isn't just any outsider. We're told in the passage that Alex read to us that Cornelius was part of the Italian cohort. That's code language to say that he is part of the Roman military machine, part of that industrial complex his job was to maintain the rules and the responsibilities, to make sure everyone stayed in line, and he too had a badge. He had authority. He had responsibility. But Cornelius isn't just some flat caricature. He's, he's complex. He's, he's contradictory. Here he is, part of this Roman military might, and, and we're told that he fears God. And we're told that he gets that it's God talking to him instantly and immediately. <clears throat> Uncomfortable truth number two in this passage is that often in our own world today, the people we want to conflate and deflate turn into a two-dimensional caricature. We're all Every single one of us are more complex and contradictory than any, any of that. But you know, what can be most perplexing, puzzling, frustrating about this passage is, is that last verse Alex read. Surely God shows no partiality. What? What? We live in a world where the cultural script is that there are winners and there are losers. There is one side and another side. How can God show no partiality? But, okay, even if we're letting God do that, that still means that I get to wear a badge, right, God? I mean, I still get to decide who's in and who's out, who gets accepted, who gets included. I, I still get to motion stop to some and for others to cross the street, right? In all this. It, it makes me wonder. I mean, here we are. We're wrapping up. We're winding down the series on Acts. There's just one more Sunday. And as I look back over the last four weeks, I, I question, is this really how we want to live? Is this really where we're want to pour our energy and effort? Alex reminded you of the passages, right? It, it all started with, with Peter and John looking in the eyes of someone who had been marginalized, reaching out with healing love, and the invitation for the church, us who follow Jesus, to look at those who cross our path, to reach out and humanize those who are marginalized, it continued on with Philip racing up alongside the, the, the one who had been othered, the one who had been outcast, the Ethiopian eunuch, sitting side by side. Can we sit side by side with those we're unsure of? 
Can we study alongside those who have different perspectives? It continued last week with Saul who became Paul. The scales that are on every single one of our eyes and how sometimes we need those to fall off and be renewed. All the way to today. To today, how, how it is that Peter, the one on the inside, needs that remedial course. I wonder if you can think a bit about the rules and regulations, both for yourself, for us as a church, for our community, for our country, for our world. What are those badges we all wear? I, I think of Pablo Picasso, the painter. He, he, was one, he once said that, that we need to learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. That's the invitation for the church today. Last week, I I said that, that sometimes our core values, they hold hands in harmony and sing out kumbaya. Sometimes they all work and fit together perfectly and beautifully and lovingly. And sometimes... Sometimes our core values are going to be in tension with each other. Sometimes how we welcome someone and our call to do justice don't quite fit together neat and tidy. And what do we do then? That's the invitation, I think, in the book of Acts. That, that, that it doesn't just give us a six-step process. What it does instead is invites us to be curious. It invites us to be creative. It invites us to keep learning the rules and practicing them like a pro so that we can break them like an artist, individually and collectively. I hope as we continue to live our core values that part of what we're hearing in Acts, that the church then and the church right here and now, we're not given a playbook. We are given a prayer book, a prayer book that can inspire and infuse us in our lives. And as we continue to live that, you know, I pray that like Peter, we might set down our badges of faith. Amen. And so it is, friends, that we unite our hearts in the spirit of prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for the ways you call us to lay our burdens down, that which is uneasy, those things that we carry with us physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, socially. There's so much that stirs within us.